Okay, now recording. All right, so we're doing 3.3 on the trig functions. So I'll lecture a while. I might sneak in a little bit of 3.4 just to get partially ahead, but I won't go that far into it. And then I'll give you a quiz and then that'll be it for this weekend. Okay, so this is our largest chapter. Okay, as you can see, there's 11 sections. We had five, eight, this is 11. Then this is seven, not eight, because we're not doing four, six. And this looks like about six sections. Okay, we're aiming for the next exam to be Friday the 26th. That's the Friday just before spring break. Right. So it's a natural time to have it. So roughly three sections per week. So three sections, three sections, three sections, and then two sections and a test. Okay. All right, so getting back to the trig derivatives. So I'll do some more of those and then go on from there. Okay, and so let's see. Okay, so what do you really need to know? I gave you lots of stuff that I need to know, but you don't need to know. So you should know this, put that on your cheat sheet, page 191. Limit as theta approaches zero, sine of theta over theta is equal to one. Key ideas is that in order for this to work, that angle, that angle, that angle have to match. So let's say this is 3x, this should be 3x, this should also be 3x, technically, although this could stay as x because if x approaches zero, 3x also approaches zero. So that, that, and that have to match, okay? And then the limit as theta approaches zero is one. And then the trig derivatives, so I ran through very rapidly the derivation. If you didn't follow it, that's okay. But you want to use this table here. Okay, put it on your cheat sheet. Again, if we were meeting face to face, I'd make you memorize it. Maybe your next teacher is going to have you memorize it. Maybe by then we're back face to face. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. All right. So I did some last time and we'll do some more. You know, 3.3 number seven, there's a C there. C is to be treated as a constant, okay? Pretend it's a number. C cosine T plus T squared sine of T. Ignore all this stuff over here. So strain marks. <laughs> so if C is a constant, the derivative of C cosine T is negative C sine of T. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. If there's a constant in front, you just keep the constant and multiply by the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine. And then plus the derivative of t squared sine t, that looks like a product rule. So let's see. First function t squared times the derivative of the second, derivative of sine of t is cosine t, plus the second function sine of t times the derivative of the first, derivative of t squared is 2t. And then maybe just a little bit of cleanup. So negative c sine t plus t squared cosine of t plus two T sine of T. Okay. All right, I'll come back to this, but let me show you 23, that recurring theme of equation of the tangent to the curve. So 23, find the equation of the tangent line to the curve Y equals cosine X minus sine X at the point pi comma negative one. Okay. Right, so when they give me that, <clears throat> so you have the point, you need the slope. Slope means derivative. So I differentiate. So y prime equals derivative cosine is negative sine x. Derivative negative sine x is negative cosine x. Remember negative one is like a coefficient. It's a coefficient of negative one here. All right, so y prime is negative sine x minus cosine x. Then I plug in pi. You say, what about the negative one? Well, negative one is for y. There's no y anywhere. So I guess you can say, technically, I did substitute negative one for all occurrences of y, of which there were none. Right? So everywhere I saw an x, I plugged in a pi. Everywhere I saw a y, I did plug in negative one. That's true. I plugged it in everywhere there was a y. There wasn't any y, so don't worry about it. <clears throat> so plug in pi and pi. 
negative sine of pi of zero minus cosine of pi is negative one. So zero minus and minus one is one. Okay, and point slope form. Y minus Y one, Y minus and minus one equals M times X minus X one, X minus pi, or Y plus one equals X minus pi. And you can stop there. All right, and now some of the problems at the end. These problems all involve that limit that I showed you just a moment ago that you definitely want to put in your formula sheet. Limit theta approaches zero, sine of theta over theta is equal to one. Okay, this should match this. This actually doesn't have to match, so to speak. Technically it should, but let's say, like I said, this was three theta and that's three theta. If theta approaches zero, three theta also approaches zero, zero which uh, means you can actually apply that, okay? So I'll show you some more of those. Okay, 43 started off like this. Limit x approaches zero of sine of three x over five x cubed minus four x. Okay, now in order to work that out, based on what I just said, what should go below that sine of three x? What, three x. So I divide top and bottom by three x. This doesn't really bother me. That's not gonna be a problem. All right, then I use the fact that the limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits, meaning put lim on top here, lim on the bottom here. So limit x approaches zero, sine three x over three x. This is limit x approaches zero. Okay, and here I actually divide it. So five x cubed over three x is five thirds x squared, right? Minus four x over three x is minus four thirds. Okay. All right, so on top, I have limit x approaches zero, sine of three x over three x, that's x approaches zero. Okay, but as I mentioned yesterday, if x approaches zero, three x, I sneak in a three, also approaches zero. Okay, I mean, if x is 0.001, three x is 0.003, it still gets very, very small as x approaches zero. Okay, so now all of this, that angle matches that, matches that, so that's gonna be one, so the numerator is one. Okay, and by direct substitution, that's zero, and that's negative four thirds. So I have one over negative four thirds. The reciprocal of negative four thirds is negative three fourths. So the answer is negative three fourths. Okay, I had a request about 3.229 for the second derivative. It's pretty bad, to be honest with you. First derivative is not too bad, although it's already kind of messy. <clears throat> but let me just show that to you. Go back to 3.229. What's the derivative of x squared over one plus e to the x? Okay, so that's the quotient root. So bottom times the derivative of the top, two x. Minus the top, x squared, times the derivative of the bottom, the derivative of one plus e to the x, derivative of one is zero, derivative of e to the x itself, all over one plus e to the x squared. Okay, and then distribute 2x plus 2x e to the x minus x squared e to the x over one plus e to the x squared. And before I take the next derivative, I think it's easier to factor out the e to the x here. So factor out e to the x, that becomes 2x minus x squared. Okay. So now the second derivative gets really, really messy. Okay, so I'll just give you the setup for it. All right, so bottom, one plus e to the x squared times the derivative of the top. So that's pretty bad. Derivative of the top. Derivative of two x is two. And then this is a product root. First times the derivative of the second, derivative of e to the x is itself. So two x minus x squared e to the x plus the second function e to the x times the derivative of the first. Derivative of the first is two minus two x. Minus, this is so long I ran out of space on the paper. The top, the top is, I just copied all that stuff, two x plus two x 
minus x squared e to the x times the derivative of the bottom. Okay, I haven't even shown you how to take the derivative of the bottom yet, unless you were to multiply it all out. Okay, go ahead and put down what I have. That's going to lead us to something called the chain rule. And if I have time, I'll sneak in some of the chain rule today. Okay, but to differentiate the bottom, just go ahead and put two times one plus e to the x times e to the x. One alternative is to actually multiply that out. That's too much work. But this is sort of a variation of the power root. You go two times one plus e to the x to the first power. And then it's times the derivative of the inside. Okay, so this is leading to the chain root, which I'll show you in a second. Okay. All over the square of the denominator. What's one plus e to the x squared squared to fourth power? You can see it's definitely very messy. Okay, and I'm not even gonna bother simplifying the algebra there, but that's pretty much all I want to show you for that. Okay. All right. Yeah, anybody who just joined late, go ahead and put, put that in the chat. I'll get it to eventually. Okay, so that was 3.229. It was a real bear to do that one. <laughs> Pretty bad problem. Okay. <clears throat> Then let's see some more of the problems that are kind of like the end. Uh, 3.3, number 41, I want to show you, yeah. Okay, tangent of 6t divided by sine of 2t. 41, limit as t approaches zero, tan 6t over sine of 2t. All right, first change tangent to sine over cosine. So sine of 6t over cosine 6t, sine 2t. Okay, you should know from algebra, sine 6t over cosine 6t, that cosine can join the sine of 2t here in the bottom. Okay. And now here comes the next weird step. So based on what we said before, <clears throat> What do I want below sine of 6t? I want 6t, it's got a match. What do I want below sine of 2t? 2t, it's got a match, okay? So again, what we said was in order to use this theorem, all the angles have to match. That one again on page 191, okay? That angle and that angle have to match. This one, not so much, but we can always get that to match. But if this is, let's say, 6t, that needs to be 6t. That technically needs to be 6t, but even if it's t, it's still going to work. Because as t approaches 0, 6t approaches 0. All right, so here's what I do. You say, what about the cosine? That doesn't even bother me, because the cosine of 0 is 1. So here's how I break it up. I split out this cosine 6t as limit t approaches zero, one over cosine 6t. Put a limb here, limb here, limit as t approaches zero of 6t over 6t. Limit as t approaches zero, sine of 2t over 2t. And you say, well, that doesn't match. That's right. Okay, now I make a match. If that's a 6t, that's a 2t. So I multiply the bottom here by one third. I can always take the constant out. So now in red is the new stuff. It's a valid step. I divide the top and bottom by 6t. So that's okay. All right. And I'm going to bring that all the way out. I'm dividing by one third, right? Dividing by one third means multiplying by three. And now I have what I want. So this is limit t approaches zero, one over cosine 6t by direct substitution. Plug in zero, you're taking a cosine of zero, which is one. This is one, this is one. Okay, and again, that matches that. This doesn't have to match. I could sneak in the six, right? If t approaches zero, six t approaches zero. So that's one. And similarly, I have limit t approaches zero, sine of two t over two t. This doesn't have a two, but you can sneak in a two. If t approaches zero, two t approaches, approaches zero. So that's one, that's one. That's one. So I have three times 
a bunch of ones. One times one divided by one. Final answer is three. Mm. All right, and then 45, and then I'm pretty much done with the section. <clears throat> I'll introduce the chain rule and then go ahead and give you the quiz. <clears throat> Limit theta approaches zero, sine of theta divided by theta plus tangent theta. Okay, again, change tangent to sine of a cosine. Okay, so I have sine theta over theta plus tangent theta. Divide top and bottom by theta. Okay, I want sine theta over theta. Okay, then over here, break this up into limit as theta approaches zero, sine of theta over theta. On the bottom, divide each of these by theta. So limit as theta approaches zero of theta over theta, theta over theta is, is one. And this one, okay, I have sine theta over cosine theta divided by theta. Again, in algebra, the cosine of theta can join the theta. So they're all in the bottom. Okay. Quick time out again. If you ever have A divided by B over C, you can make it A over B, C. That B can just sneak down and join the C. Okay, so this sine theta over cosine theta divided by theta, just sneak in the cosine with the theta. So I have limit theta approaches zero of theta divided by theta, which is one. Then limit theta approaches zero, sine theta over theta, which is one and one. And then limit theta approaches zero of one over cosine theta. And there we go. This is one. This is one. This is one by direct substitution. So if I plug in zero, I'm taking the cosine of zero, which is one. One over one is one. All right, so there we go. One divided by one plus one times one. One over one plus one, one half. And that's that. All right, folks, I've done everything I was going to do in 3.3, so I'm par for the week. I am going to sneak in just a tiny bit of 3.4, and then I'll stop and give you the quiz. Okay, so next rule 3.4, I'll mark this off. 3.4 is something called the chain rule, and I sort of already gave you a taste of that when I was doing that other long derivative there. So 3.4, the chain rule. You do the chain rule when you have a composition of functions, a function inside a function, or a function of a function. Okay, page 198. I'm not even going to go over the proof of this. It's long and tedious, and the book doesn't even give it to you in the most general case. Okay. <clears throat> But using the Leibniz notation, this does seem kind of plausible. dy dx, rate of change of y with respect to x. dy du, du dx. Don't write this down right now, actually. But it does seem kind of plausible. Rate of change of y with respect to u. Rate, rate of change of u with respect to x. It kind of looks like you can cancel out the du's, right? Then you have dy dx. That's sort of what's going on here. But now here is the chain rule. So. Uh, what do you want to put on your cheat sheet? Probably just this right here. You can put this if you want to, but I don't think you need to. Okay, so how do you differentiate a composition, f of g of x? Okay, so capital F is the composition, f of g. So you take the derivative of the outside function with respect to the inside, f prime of g of x, and then it's times the derivative of the inside function, f prime of g of x, times g prime of x. This is called the chain rule. If you use the Leibniz notation, dy dx is dy du, du dx. Again, this is the Leibniz notation, L-E-I-B-N-I-Z. Okay, so you have an outside function and an inside function. You take the derivative of the outside function with respect to the inside, as we say, first, and then it's times the derivative of the inside function. This thing here is dy du. Would you temporarily call that u, that's dy du. And then g prime of x is du dx. Then it kind of looks like the du's 
cancel out. Okay, I'm just going to show you one quick example just to give you a feeling of it, and then I'll stop and give you the quiz. Okay. So 3.4, number seven. Capital F of X is 5X to the sixth plus 2X cubed to the fourth power. Okay, so it's not just X to the fourth power. We know how to differentiate X to the fourth power, 4X cubed. It's a complicated function to the fourth power. So how does the chain rule work here? <clears throat> All right. So it starts off, as you might guess, four, copy the 5x to the 6 plus 2x cubed, cubed. So that's normal. That's what we've been doing. The new stuff is then it's times the derivative of the inside. So I have to differentiate the inside, which is 30x to the fifth plus 6x squared. And there we go. Okay, so that's the first example I'm going to show you for the chain rule. Okay, you have an outside function. You have an inside function. So you take the derivative of the outside with respect to the inside, meaning mm -hmm. 4 5x to the 6 plus 2x cubed, cubed. Okay. Most students are okay with that, but then they might forget. You have to multiply the derivative of the inside. Then I differentiate inside 30x to the fifth plus 6x squared. Okay. So that's a little taste of how the chain rule works. Okay, and then I was going to stop and give you the quiz. Okay, so any questions about today's material or any of this? Otherwise, we'll go straight to the quiz. I'll put you in your breakout groups and then have a good weekend. So any questions quickly about what we've covered? You can either put it in a chat or unmute yourself. Okay, I don't hear or see anything. So get your cell phones ready or be ready to do a screenshot. And here's today's quiz. Okay, as normal, put your first and last name, first and last name of everybody in your group. And I will grade just one of the people in your group. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. Find the following derivatives. Number one, y equals 3x squared minus 5x plus 8. That should be very easy. Number two, f of x is x cubed e to the x. Looks like the product root. Number three, y equals 5x minus 12 over 3x plus 10. Looks like a quotient root. <clears throat> For number three, you should simplify the numerator but don't simplify the denominator, you know, clean up the top. And by the way, you should do a derivative symbol. In other words, you should put down either y prime or f prime of x as the case may be. Okay, I'll hold it for maybe another 15 seconds. Okay, again, put your first and last name, first and last name of everybody in your group. Okay, if you finish early, you may leave. Uh, I will grade just one person in your group. So the only way to be sure that it's correct is to make sure everybody in your group has the right answer. Okay, number one is y equals 3x squared minus 5x plus 8. Number two, f of x is x cubed e to the x. Looks like the product root. Number three, y equals 5x minus 12 over 3x plus 10. Looks like the quotient root. Clean up the top, but you don't have to multiply out the bottom. Okay, I will now assume that everybody has it. Go ahead and get started. Give me a moment to set up the breakout rooms. I'm also going to stop.